I have a phenomenal GPU. With 40 watts of pure graphics power and 4 gigs of VRAM, the RTX 3050 Mobile represents the pinnacle of modern portable gaming. It can run the latest games like Oblivion Remastered at 16 FPS on minimum settings, with frame gen enabled. Yeah, this thing sucks kinda bad. In some cases, it's even slower than the GTX 970 I had before, a decade old graphics card. And this gives me a pretty interesting problem as a graphics programmer. In order to do graphics, you need a computer that can, well, do graphics, which means most of the stuff that I write needs to be pretty optimized for low-end hardware. This is made harder since most of what I want to do is lighting, specifically global illumination, which is pretty resource intensive. I still want at least a half-decent GI that can run at reasonable frame times though, even on GPUs that are worse than mine. And today, I'm going to go over my process for doing just that. In order to come up with a tailored GI solution for low-end hardware, I need to figure out what I'm okay sacrificing and what I refuse to compromise on. In this case, I'm okay losing some detail in the shadows, and I'm perfectly fine with it being pretty low precision, however, I don't want it to be noisy and I don't want it to have noticeable ghosting. I've also given myself a somewhat unrealistic maximum frame budget of 1.5 milliseconds on my GPU, which should at most come to about a 5fps drop in games where I'm already locked to 60fps. This will be operating in screen space for both performance reasons and since I'm implementing it through Reshade, but that gives significant opportunities for aggressive optimization. Now I'm going to give a quick overview on how SSGI works because it's actually pretty clever despite all the caveats that it has. For those of you who don't know, global illumination is just light bouncing off of surfaces. It's pretty simple in concept, but actually doing it and doing it well in real time is very hard. Typically, the best way to calculate global illumination is by path tracing, where we shoot a bunch of random rays off a point to figure out all the nearby surfaces that illuminate it. But this is very expensive and very noisy. SSGI at least partially solves the expensive bit by avoiding tracing rays in actual geometry. Most games have a set of G buffers or geometry buffers that contain the depth and the normals, as well as an HDR color buffer that tells us exactly how bright each point is. From this data, we can reconstruct the actual geometry from the pixels on screen and trace rays through the set of textures instead of the actual triangles for quite a bit cheaper. However, this doesn't actually mean it's cheap. Badly implemented and unoptimized SSGI can actually run worse than quite a few raw path tracing implementations. To start, let's get a basic SSGI implementation down, just standard rays traced in screen space. Now while this clearly is lighting, it's pretty noisy, which makes sense since we're only tracing one ray per pixel. And this has a pretty easy fix. We just, uh, take more samples. Of course, this isn't actually practical for real time, and you can see that I'm getting, uh, zero FPS. So as much as I'd love to take a thousand samples per pixel, it's not really viable. And if we want less noise, we're gonna have to be a bit smarter. Taking a look at how many of our rays don't actually hit anything, you can see that we're wasting a ton of samples. All of the white pixels don't actually contribute to the final result, but those rays are still getting traced regardless. They're taking quite a bit of performance. To get past this issue, we're going to have to think about our rays a little bit differently. Because we're working in screen space, we don't actually need to trace a bunch of rays along the 3D geometry. Instead, we can treat the depth buffer as sort of a height field and march across that in slices. If you want shadows, we can also keep track of a horizon that tells us if new samples are hidden behind older samples. This is the core idea behind horizon-based GI. The nice thing about it is that it guarantees each slice has at least one valid hit, potentially many more. While the results are slightly different due to some things with the falloff, as well as some optimizations that I've made and some corners that I cut, it's pretty close and significantly less noisy for the performance cost. The next optimization that I want to talk about is pre-filtering, which is just blurring the data you sample from. This is helpful for a couple of reasons. By blurring the data, each sample that we take has a larger pool it's pulling from, which means that we get less noise overall for the same number of samples, although it does have a precision trade-off. The big reason, though, is that blurrier data can be represented with smaller textures, and generally speaking for stuff like GI where we need to sample a really large area of the screen, smaller textures are significantly cheaper to sample from than larger textures. And because we can represent the blurred samples with smaller textures, we can take advantage of mip mapping to generate this blurred data for almost no cost and access varying levels of blurred data at runtime. Okay, so now we have relatively decent looking GI, but it's noisy. And to fix that, we'll need, well, denoising. There's generally two different main types of denoising, spatial and temporal. 
Spatial denoising is just finding ways to blur the image and remove noise without removing too much detail. It's denoising over space. Temporal denoising is accumulating samples over time, and it's really attractive for a couple of reasons. Not only is it significantly cheaper than spatial denoising, but it also doesn't remove details. That is, as long as the camera stays still. Both games, the camera is almost always moving, so in order to prevent ghosting, we need to use motion vectors to tell us how things have moved between frames, and we need to reject samples that were reprojected incorrectly, which means that we need to use temporal denoising pretty sparingly in order to get something smooth and responsive. Because temporal denoising has to be used pretty sparingly, we almost always still have to apply some spatial denoising on top of it. There's a ton of spatial denoisers out there, but in this case, I'm going to use the joint bilateral filter. Now, the bilateral filter is pretty simple. We check points in a small radius, assign them weights based on how similar they are to the current pixel, and then average the results together. This smooths out noise pretty well and preserves most edges. The joint bilateral filter does the same thing, but it takes additional features into account. In this case, the depth and the normals. The nice thing about the depth and the normals is that they don't really have any noise to begin with, which means that we can use much pickier weights to remove noise without blurring details in the geometry. As you can see, this gives a pretty nice result, especially when paired with temporal denoising. The thing is, this is still far too slow. The combined cost, even with the mip mapping optimization, is almost 14 milliseconds, which is about 10 times slower than I need it to be. But we can't just pull this kind of performance out of nowhere, and to approach anything even close to that in our speed increase, we'll need to carefully remove all our bottlenecks, improve cache coherence during sampling, minimize instructions where it matters, pack our buffers as minimally as possible, and even then it kind of matters fast. Oh wait, we can just... Because we already have a relatively clean and noiseless output, we can actually reduce the resolution quite a bit without having too many issues. In this case, going down to a quarter of the resolution is still fairly low noise, and it runs fast enough to fit in my performance budget with room to spare. But this doesn't look good. While it is much cheaper, rendering 16 times fewer pixels gives us a much blurrier result, and to fix that, we're going to need to upscale. Now, long before NVIDIA decided that real pixels and frames were for losers, rendering effects like ambient occlusion and volumetric lighting at a lower resolution and then upscaling them had actually become, and still is, a pretty standard practice for most games. And a pretty common and reliable method for this, just like with our denoiser, is the bilateral filter. Now, when denoising, we use the bilateral filter to blur while preserving edges, but in this case we can also use it to upscale data, assuming we have access to higher resolution features. The process is roughly the same, but instead of blurring, we compare our current high resolution depth to the lower resolution depth used by our GI, and weight samples accordingly. This lets our current pixel find the best matches from nearby low resolution pixels, and preserves depth edges. And this doesn't look too bad. The depth edges are crisp, it's performant, but it can be better. The biggest downside with only using depth for upscaling is that the geometry edges are just kind of ignored. There's a few ways we could go about fixing this, one of them being to also use the normals during upscaling, but this isn't a perfect solution. And if a surface is significantly different from its neighbors, then we can't represent accurately, and it'll just get blurred. The solution that I've picked for this is spherical harmonics. Now, spherical harmonics are one of those things that seem really complicated at first. If you look up what they are, you'll probably come across some definition like this one, or some variation of it, but in practice, it's pretty simple. Spherical harmonics are really just the average brightness of a sphere, and some numbers that tell us if an area on that sphere is brighter or darker than that average. And while this is pretty simple, it lets us represent light directionally instead of just a single value. So if some part of the surface has really detailed and rough geometry, we can approximate how it might be lit instead of just blurring and hoping for the best. This comes across pretty well in the details of the lion head in Sponza, for example. And with that, we're pretty much done. Some things I didn't really mention is that I'm also calculating ambient occlusion at the same time as GI for basically free, as well as the blending and the choices of noise functions, which have a fairly decent impact on the result, but overall, that's the gist of it. Before I go, I'll give some final before and after comparisons blended into an actual scene, but I can honestly say I'm very happy with how this has turned out. As usual, links to Patreon, Discord, and GitHub can be found in the description below, and I hope you have a wonderful day.